Hey guys, I want to wish you all a happy Data Privacy Day. Today, January 28th, is the official day for Data Privacy Day. And for today, I made a large blog post where I organized what I feel are the most important tutorials that are on my blog and channel. And so, I'd like to go over that with you today and we can talk a little bit about why each one's important. At least I'll, I'll breeze through them real quick and you can check them out in your own time. But these are the tutorials that I personally recommend. I also did a post on Mastodon for Data Privacy Day with some simple steps that you can take, like turning off your radio devices, which would be Wi-Fi, things like that, using Tor and I2P, hidden services of each wherever possible. This includes end-to-end -end encryption. That prevents you from undergoing a man-in-the-middle attack because of the way the Tor and I2P networks are set up. A man-in-the-middle attack won't occur for the actual hidden service sites. Now, ClearNet is another story. You'll have to mind your HTTPS on ClearNet sites over it. But there is end-to-end -end encryption enforced on I2P and Tor hidden service sites like .onion.i2p. And of course, use front ends for searching any big tech sites especially. Now I specifically mentioned big tech because, you know, we all know what big tech is. It's social medias, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the YouTubes. Now the front ends, what that allows you to do is it allows you to use front end proxy websites for searching these websites and so it puts a middle party between you and if you look at my posts and some of the ones that I have listed down on this post which I highly recommend you check this out this is pretty much a little privacy guide for you to check out and I want to give a shout out to Greg for suggesting putting together a privacy guide a little bit ago so I want to send a thank you out to him and of course I have all of the bullet points up here and I've broken it down into the most important tutorials for you to check out on my blog and channel. I have things like do you need a VPN and who can you trust? I go over parts of history. I like to include that kind of thing because when you look at history you can kind of pretty much see exactly what you should expect. Not everything that's occurring may have been discovered but by looking at what has been discovered we can determine what may be out there. And so that's what I like to do in certain videos, but it's quite many tutorials, so I'm not going to read all of them, but I do highly recommend you check them out. I hope it helps you. We'll go over some of the topics here. So of course there's VPN, who can I trust? And I go over several stories where there were malicious VPNs and potentially malicious VPNs, wherein the ones that said there were no log were selling the logs, were selling out customers. Now, this doesn't occur with everyone. If you want to find a VPN, if you feel the need for a VPN, you may not need one at all. What you're doing with a VPN is you're trading that data your ISP would have and you're handing it over to another private company. It's up to you. Decide if it meets your threat model. It may or may not meet your threat model. You may want to use Tor instead. Tor browser is a great solution. Then I have Tor ClearNet versus VPN versus Tor Hidden Service. You can also throw I2P in there as well. It's similar in the protections as a Tor Hidden Service for the encryption. And um, some of the anonymity is, it has some similarities with the onion routing versus garlic routing. And then, of course, what is a bridge? Should I use a bridge? That regards Tor. Contribute, how to be a snowflake bridge with an automated installer I wrote for everyone. So if you have trouble and you want to be a snowflake, you have a Raspberry Pi or another single board computer or an old computer, and you want to turn it into a snowflake so you can help contribute to the Tor network, well, simply check out my... Uh, script to automate that install in one command you'll have a snowflake up and running then uh, of course I have use I2P section get started with I2P next we have anonymous clear net on I2P plus which is a nice app for you it's a fork of I2P router and uh, I go through the whole process how to set everything up and I'll be having more content related I2P coming up also show the pine phone and pine tab on I2P then I have root use front ends now what front ends are I just explained what they were they're actually a middle party that handles the actual transaction on the website for you so if you connect to a Tor hidden service front end or an I2P 
front end, you will be anonymized through those networks, and that middle party will then do the searches for you. And I have customized Tor Browser with Privacy Redirect. That'll automate using front ends in Tor Browser. I suggest downloading a second copy of Tor Browser for this. Use it for your open source intelligence work and things like that. Then I have lists of proxies for you if you want to have you know, public free proxies that you can add. You can check out my proxy chains tutorials. I'm going to probably add that in. Uh, we have search Twitter, YouTube, street maps anonymously. Then I have use encryption where possible. Getting started with PGP, learn it in 11 minutes, and how to encrypt texts and send messages, import, export keys, how to do everything you need to do to have conversations. You could even text message using PGP. Knowing that SMS text messaging is not really secure, you have things like IMSI catchers which can read your texts if they are not only, you know, passively set up and they could perform full man in the middle attacks. Then we have checking signed images. One of the most important topics if you use Linux is checking the cryptographic integrity of those images that you're downloading. If you're not checking the image signature, at least check the checksum. So, of course, I have multiple checksum tutorials I wrote down here. I also have videos. So a lot of these posts also have the video that relates and also some additional tips and information. So I do highly suggest follow this blog. It's free to follow. You don't, you know, you don't have to buy me a coffee despite the domain name. It is for everyone. And all of these posts and tutorials on this post are completely public, so you can share them. You know, I highly appreciate everyone who shares this stuff on social media, help get it out there. I spent a lot of time making these tutorials, so I really appreciate your help getting those out there. And then encryption with Torification and combined sandboxing. We use Bubble Wrap, which is actually inside the flat pack, and also talk about flat seal which helps you manage it in a GUI interface then we have Thunderbird and onion mail with PGP encryption that's an email client where you can set up end-to-end -end encryption with all your email communications that's really important and also you can get the pop 3 to store it locally instead of on the server where it would be removed from the server and be stored right in your computer where your Thunderbird client is. You can also see that Thunderbird comes on tail, so it's already there for you if you want to use this. I also go through the Torification setup for people who aren't using a Torfied operating system like Tails or Hunix. So you can follow this on any Linux operating system. You can actually follow it on other operating systems as well. You know, most of my stuff is geared because I'm a Linux user, of course, you're going to see my Linux screenshots, but the same applications are cross-platform. So you're going to see the same settings, the same exact application, and you can follow them straight through for the most part until you see terminal stuff. Now, I, you know, you'll be able to start the Tor client on your own, you know, operating system in your own way. Now I have Crypto Homes. It's a little tool that I'm working on. It automates creating a hardware key and an associated encrypted home volume disk creation. So you can create multiple encrypted homes and you can actually have those portable. You say you're traveling and you know the place you're going, maybe you're a journalist or activist or something, and you don't want your, you know, private, you know, research or journalistic work being taken. So you might not take certain things with you because you have these encrypted homes and you have an associated hardware key as well. And I'll go over more of that in coming videos. We have the checksums, of course, you're going to be able to check every file on your system. I have for Debian and Archbase systems different commands you can use to check each file for modification. So if something malicious is on your computer or made changes to your computer, you should be able to catch that. Of course, you may want to use you may want to boot from a live disk if you're really trying to be, you know, picky about it. But uh, then there's also an article on iPhone users. Make sure you enable end-to-end -end cloud encryption and that the standard encryption isn't really end-to-end. -end. In fact, they have a key escrow on the standard. So you're going to want to switch over to the advanced encryption on your iPhone. Then we have malicious HTTPS, certificate authority abuse, and mind your fingerprints. So make sure your connection is secure. Even if it looks secure, there were BIOS backdoors like Superfish, which would make it look secure on those computers, 40 million of them. And then, of course, you would have to go and check the actual fingerprint to cross-reference that. Then we have Modified Elephant Story. Now, this is a story I framed in a way that uh, 
tells the importance of encryption because in this story, it's a real story, it happened in India, activists, human rights activists were framed because their drives were modified. Now with encryption, as long as the drive is off, that encryption protects the data from modification. So these poor activists and human rights activists, even lawyers and academics, had evidence, false evidence, they were framed, false evidence planted on them. Now, if there was strong encryption and that data was at that time not unlocked, there would be no way to plant that evidence on that drive to frame those individuals. So that's a good story. I highly suggest checking it out. I may do a follow-up. Now we have SSH, weak passwords, demo, and how to restrict from brute force attacks. So we go through the SSHD configuration. We talk about how we can restrict it. I also demonstrate with weak default passwords how quick it is to crack SSH otherwise. Then we have SSH part two, don't be a victim of a man in the middle attack. I go over how to check the fingerprints from server to client side, how to then set up key authentication so you have strong login authentication. You actually disable PAM. You disable the password authentication and you stick with a purely key authentication on SSH. Highly recommend that if you use SSH for anything. Now we go over backdoors discovered in hardware, things like BIOS backdoors that have been found over time. Also other things like Intel Management Engine and AMT, which provide hidden remote access where you can't detect it locally on the machine with Wireshark because it has its own TCPI stack and its own um, ability to, you know, route that through an out-of-band network, which means that it's not going to be on your uh, your standard operating system. You're not going to see it right in front of you on there, so you'll have to use something like a network detection method. Now, we also have Learn RK Hunter. I go over how to interpret and use RK Hunter and the logs that it presents so you can learn to detect backdoors on your Linux or BSD system. Then we have compartmentalize firewall, fire jail, how to get started with sandboxing on Linux, fire jail privacy specific tips and demonstration. We have open snitch, highly recommend this for Linux users. You can detect every single process on your system trying to connect out to different things. So different things people found in certain browsers that were say calling home, providing tele telemetry and other things, sometimes more malicious than that. And then we have how to isolate and thwart malicious app activity collection. And in this instance, I use a very popular uh, Audacity app that changed ownership and uh, it had some connecting out things that were going to come up so I decided to use that as an example and I want to thank you for following my channel thank you to everyone who has been following me from the beginning really want to send a shout out to those who have supported this as well and by support I don't just mean you know buying me a coffee I mean people simply sharing my posts simply sharing links costs absolutely nothing to do that and I will continue doing this as long as I'm able to do it. So appreciate your support and help me out by sharing this video, share the blog, and any posts you find helpful. I try to bring really unique content that you're not going to find elsewhere. A lot of times I bring my own ideas and concepts into things. So make sure to check out this post. And I want to wish you a happy data privacy day. Until next time. This is RTP, and I will see you in the next one.